We're ready. Stick of the dump. Chapter one, the ground gives way. If you went too near the edge of the chalk pit, the ground would give way. Barna had been told this often enough. Everybody had told him. His grandmother, every time he came to stay with her. His sister, every time she was telling him something else. Barney had a feeling, something in his middle, that this was probably true, true about the ground giving away. But still, there was a difference between being told and seeing what happens. And today was one of those grey days when there was nothing to do, nothing to play and nowhere to go, except the chalk pit or the dump. Barney got through the rickety fence and went to the edge of the pit. This had been the side of the hill once, he told himself. Men had to come and dig away chalk and left this huge hole in the earth. He thought all of the sticks of chalk they must have made, and all of the blackboards, and all of the schools that they must have written on. They must have dug and dug for a hundred years. And then they got tired of digging, and somebody had told them to stop before they dug away all of the hill. And now they did not know what to do with this empty hole, and they were trying to fill it up again. Everything people didn't want, that they threw it into the bottom of the pit. He crawled through the rough grass and peered over. The sides of the pit were white chalk, with lines of flint poking out like bones in places. At the top was crumbly brown earth and the roots of the trees that grew on the edge. The roots looped over the edge, twined in the air and grew back into the earth. Some of the trees hung over the edge, holding on desperately by a few roots. The earth and chalk had fallen away beneath them and one day they too would fall to the bottom of the pit. Strings of ivy and the creeper old man, called Old Man's Beard hung in the air. Far below was the bottom of the pit, the dump. Barney could see strange bits of wreckage among those among the moss and the elder bushes and nettles. Was that a steering wheel of a ship? The tail of an aeroplane? At least there was a real bicycle. Barney felt sure he could make it, if only he could go and get it. They didn't let him have a bicycle. Barney wished he was at the bottom of the pit, and the ground gave way. Barney felt his head going down and his feet going up. There was a rattle of falling earth beneath him. Then he was falling, still clutching the clump of grass that was, that was falling with him. This is what it was like when the ground gives way, thought Barney. Then he seemed to turn a complete somersault in the air, bumped into a ledge of chalk halfway down and crashed him through creepers and ivy and branches and landed on a bank of moss. His, thought, he thought, yeah, his thoughts did those funny things they do when you bump your head and then you suddenly find yourself thinking about what you had for dinner last Tuesday all mixed up with seven times six. Barney lay with his eyes shut, waiting for his thoughts to stop being mixed up, and then he opened them. He was lying in a kind of shelter. Looking up, he could see a roof, or part of a roof, made of elder branches, a very rotten old carpet, and a rolled old rusty, old rusty sheets of iron. There was a big hole through which he must have fallen. He could see the white walls of the cliff, the trees and the creepers at the top and the sky with the clouds passing over it. Barney decided he wasn't dead. He didn't even seem to be much hurt. He turned his head and looked around him. It was dark in this den. After looking at the white chalk, he couldn't see what sort of place this was. It seemed to be partly a cave dug into the chalk, partly a shelter built over the mouth of the cave. There was a cool, damp smell. Wood lice and earwigs dropped from the roof where he had thought we had broken through it. But what had happened to his legs? He couldn't sit up when he tried to. His legs wouldn't move. Perhaps I've broken them, Barney thought. What shall I do then? He looked at his legs to see if they were all right and found that they were all tangled up with creeper from the face of the cliff. Who tied me up? Thought Barney. He kicked his legs to try to get them free, but it was no use. There were yards of creeper trailing down from the cliff. I suppose I got tangled up when I fell, he thought. Expect, expect. I would have broken my neck if I hadn't. He lay quiet and looked around the cave again. Now that his eyes were used to it, he could see further into the dark part of the cave. There was somebody there. Or something. Something or somebody had a lot of shaggy black hair and two bright black eyes that were looking very hard at Barney. Hello, said Barney. Something, something said nothing. I fell down the cliff, said Barney. Somebody grunted. My name's Barney. Somebody, something, made a noise that sounded like Stig. Do you think you could help me undo my feet, Mr Stig? Barney asked politely. I've got a pocket knife, he 
he added, remembering that he had a pocket knife that he'd found among the wood shavings on the floor of his grandfather's workshop. It was quite a good knife, except one blade had come off and the other was broken in half and rather blunt. Good thing I put it in my pocket, he thought. He wriggled so he could reach the, ha reach the knife and managed to open the rusty half blade. <clears throat> he tried to reach the creepers around his legs, but found it was difficult to cut the creepers with a blunt knife when your feet are tied above your head. The thing, sitting in the corner, seemed to be interested. It got up and moved towards Barney into the light. Barney was glad to see it was a somebody after all. Funny way to dress, though, he thought. Rabbit skins around the middle. No shoes. No socks. Oh, puff, said Barney. I can't reach my feet. You do it, Stig. He handed the knife to Stig. Stig turned over and felt it with his strong, hairy hands and tested the edge with his thumb. Then, instead of trying to cut the creepers, he squatted down on the ground and picked up a broken stone. He's going to sharpen the knife, thought Barney. But no, it seemed more as if he was sharpening the stone, using the hard knife to chip with. Stig was carefully flaking tiny splinters off the edge of the flint until he had a thin, sharp blade. Then he sprang up and with two or three slashes cut through the creeper that tied Barney's feet. Barney sat up. Golly, he said, you are clever. I bet my granddad couldn't do that, and he's very good at making things. Stig grinned. Then he went back to the cave and hid the broken knife under a pile of rubbish. My knife, protested Barney, but Stig took no notice. Barney got up and went into the dark part of the cave. He'd never seen anything like the collection of bits and pieces, odds and ends, bric-a-brac and old brock, that this stig creature had lying about his den. There were stones and bones, fossils and bottles, skins and tins, stacks of sticks and hanks of string. There were motor car tyres and hats from old scarecrows, nuts and bolts and bobbles from brass neck, brass bedsteads. There was a coal scuttle full of dead electric light bulbs and a basin with rusty screws and nails in it. There was a pile of bracken and newspapers that looked as if it was used for a bed. The place looked as if it had never been given a tidy up. I wish I lived here, said Barney. Stig seemed to understand that Barney was approving of his home and his face lit up. He took on the, he took on the air of a householder showing a visitor around his property and began pointing out some of the things he seemed particularly proud of. First, the plumbing, where the water dripped through the crack in the roof of the cave. He had wedged a muddy the mud guard of a bicycle. The water ran along this, through the tube of a, of a vacuum cleaner, and into a big can with writing on it. By the side of this was a plastic football, carefully cut in half. The stig dipped, it, dipped up some water and offered it to Barney. Barney had swallowed a mouthful before he made the writing on the can. It said weed killer. However, the water only tasted of rust and rubber. It was the dark back of the cave, Stig went to the front where the ashes of the fire were smoking faintly, blew on them, picked up a book and lay beside his bed, tore out a page and rolled it up, lit it at the fire and carried it to the lamp, set in a niche in the wall. As it flared up, Barna could see that it was in fact an old teapot, filled with some kind of oil, and with a bootlace hanging out of it, out of it for a wick. In the light of the lamp, Stig went to the very back of the cave and began to thump the wall and, and point and explained something in his strange grunting language. Barney did not understand a word, but he recognised the tone of voice, like when good grown-ups go on about. I'm thinking of tearing this down and building here, and having this done up. Stig had been digging into the wall, enlarging his cave. There was a bit of an old bed he had been using as a pick, and a baby's bath full of loose chalk to be carried away. Barney made the interesting, interested sort of noises you are supposed to make, when people tell you they're going to put up plastic wallpaper with pictures of mouse traps on it. But Stig reached up to a bunch of turnips hanging from a poker stuck in the wall. He handed Barney a turnip, took one for himself and began to eat it. Barney sat down on the bundle of old magazines done up with string and munched away at the turnip. The turnip at least was fresh and it tasted better to him than the cream of spinach he had hidden under his spoon at dinner time. Stig looked at Barney. Funny person to find living next door to you, he thought. Stig did not seem much bigger than, than himself, but he looked very strong, and his hands looked cl cleverer than his face. How old was he? Ten? Twenty? A hundred? A thousand? Have you been here long? asked Barney. Stig grinned again. Long? he said. Long, long, long. But it sounded more like an echo, or a parrot copying somebody, 
than an answer to his question. I'm staying at my grandmother's house, said Barney. Stig just looked at him. Oh well, thought Barney. If he's not interested in talking, I don't mind. He stood up. I better go now, he said. Thank you for having me. Can I have my knife back, please? Stig still looked blank. Knife, said Barney, and made a cutting movement with his hand. Stig picked up the sharp worked flint from the floor of the cave and gave it to Barney. Oh, can I have that? exclaimed Barney. Thank you. He looked at the stone, hard and shiny. Almost like a diamond, but much more useful. Then he put it in his pocket and said goodbye again, and went out of the low door of the shelter. It was getting late in the autumn evening, and it was already dark and gloomy in the pit. Barney knew that there was a way out right at the end of the other pit, and by going a long way around he could get back to the house. There were rustlings and dry leaves and muffled sounds from the middle of the bramble patches, but somehow Barney found he didn't mind. He felt the hard stone in his pocket and thought of Stig in his, in his den under the cliff. You weren't likely to find anything stranger than Stig, wherever you looked, and, well, Stig was his friend. When he got back to the house, his grandmother and sister Lou were just coming in from feeding the hens. Where have you been all the time? asked grandmother. I went to the chalk pit, said Barney. All by yourself? exclaimed Lou. Yes, of course, he said. What have you been doing? Asked, his grandmother asked. Well, I fell and bumped my head. Poor old Barney, said Lou and laughed. But it was all right, Barney went on, because I met Stig. Who's Stig? they both asked together. Well, he's a sort of boy, replied Barney. He just wears rabbit skins and lives in a cave. He gets his water through a vacuum cleaner and puts chalk in his bath. He's my friend. Good gracious, exclaimed his grandmother. What funny friends you have, my dear. He means he's been playing with cavemen, Lou exclaimed helpfully. Stig's just a pretend friend, isn't he, Barney? No, he's really true, Barney protested. Of course he's true, his grandmother smiled. Now, Lou, don't tease Barney. Let's pretend Stig's a wicked wizard who lives in a cave and turns people into stone, Lou began eagerly. She was always inventing stories and games like that. No, said Barney quietly, feeling the sharp flint in his pocket. Stig's nice. He's my friend. That night, he kept the flint under his pillow and thought of Stig out there in the pit, sleeping on his broken bracken, on his bed of bracken and old newspapers. He wished he'd lived all the time at Granny's house so that he could get to know Stig. He had to go back the day after tomorrow. Never mind. He visit, he'll visit Stig in the morning. Chapter 2 Digging with Stig It was a fine autumn morning, and the grass was very wet with dew outside. Barney pushed his breakfast down as fast as he could manage. What do you want to do today? his grandmother asked as she drank coffee. I have to go to Inter Seven Oaks this morning. Do you want to come? Barney's heart sank. Go into Seven Oaks? Well, it was all right if you had nothing else to do, but you had to go and see Stig. No, thank you, Granny, he said. I don't think I want to go into Seven Oaks today. You'll be quite happy just messing about here, his grandmother asked. Yes, thank you. I just want to mess about with, um, with Stig. Oh, I see, Granny smiled, with your friend Stig. Well, Mrs. Pratt will be here all, all the morning, so if you like, you can stay with her. And Stig, of course. Lou said she would like to go into town, but she wasn't particularly interested in playing with Stig. Barney knew from the way she was, she had, the way she said it, she still thought Stig was only a pretend friend. But that was all right. If she didn't want to meet Stig, she didn't need to. Can I go out now? he asked. All right, said Granny. Put your boots on, she called after him as he shot through the door. Barney's feet made dark prints in the dew as he headed across the lawn towards the chalk pit. Then he stopped and stood still right in the middle of the lawn. Suppose he didn't find Stig after all. The sun was bright. Yellow leaves fluttered down from the elm trees onto the grass. A robin puffed its breast on the rose tree and squeaked at him. Barney suddenly wasn't sure that he believed in Stig himself. It wasn't a Stiggish day. Like yesterday when he'd fallen down the pit. He had fallen, hadn't he? He felt the bump on, his back of the, on the back of his head. Yes, that was real enough. He'd fallen and bumped his head. And then what? Funny things happen. Funny things happen when you bump your head. Perhaps you only saw Stig when you fell and bumped your head. He didn't think he wanted to fall over the cliff again on purpose and bump his head again. 
Was Stig a person you could just go and play with? Like the children at the end of the road, near home? He had to find out. But he didn't want to go to the chalk pit and find nothing. He stood with his hands in his pocket in the middle of the lawn, his fingers playing with something hard in his left, left hand pocket of his jeans. He remembered something and pulled it out, pulled the thing out he had in his hand. Of course, the flint. He looked at the glinting in the sunlight, like a black diamond with its chipped pattern. He seen Stig make it. There was no mistake about that. Of course, Stig was real. He set off again at a run, climbed the fence into the paddock and waded through the long, wet grass on the other side. The copse around the edge of the chalk pit looked dark beyond the sunlit black grass. In the middle of the paddock, he found himself slowing down and stopping again. Something in the back of his mind was telling him that he had seen pictures of chipped flints in books, and real ones in museums, and that they were made thousands of years ago by rough people who weren't alive any longer. People found them and put them in cases with notices on them. Perhaps he just found this one, and imagined everything else. And supposing he hadn't imagined Stig, was the sort of person who liked people to coming round to play? Was he the sort of person who liked people coming round to play? Well, he told himself, all he really wanted to do was to look at the place we had fallen over yesterday. Have another look at the dump. There was that bicycle anyway. He walked to the edge of the paddock. A clump of brown grass jumped up from under his feet and bounced away towards the bramble patch, showing a white tail and two long ears. Barney's heart bumped, but it was only a rabbit. After he ran after it, but it had disappeared in the thick undergrowth. Feeling bolder, he climbed over the fence and went towards the edge of the pit, making sure that this time he kept near the big large tree that seemed to be well anchored to the side and peeped over. He could see the patch of raw earth and white chalk where the ground had given way under him, the dangling creepers lowered down, and a scatter of broken chalk at the bottom. He craned over to see the hole that he had made in the roof of the den. There was a pile of branches and rubbish against the foot of the cliff, but no gaping hole, no, not a sign of a hole, of a roof, or even of a den, or even of a stig. He listened. A blackbird, turning dry leaves over in search of worms, was making so much noise it was too big for itself. But apart from that, the pit was silent and empty. Barney walked away from the edge of the pit and climbed over the fence into the sunshine of the paddock, thinking hard. He looked at the stone in his hand. He felt the bump on his head. He had seen the raw patch where the ground had, had given away. He remembered crashing through a sort of roof and leaving a, a, leaving a big gaping hole. And yet there wasn't a hole, so he couldn't have made one. But he must have landed somewhere. And he had that clear picture in his head of looking up through the hole at the side of the cliff and the clouds passing over the, over the sky. And suddenly, as he stood up in the middle of the paddock, he gave a big jump and the answer came to him like getting a sum right. If there isn't a hole, if there wasn't a hole, it was because somebody had mended it. Stig wasn't the sort of person to leave a large hole in his roof. Well, not for long. Not his friend Stig. All at once, everything fitted together. Yesterday's adventure on that stiggish sort of afternoon, the bump on his head, the flint, and this bright autumn morning when he was going to visit his friend Stig. And he was quite clear in his head now what he was going to do and how he was going to do it. He set off running, back to the garden. Presents for Stig. When you visit people this time of year, you always brought something from the garden. Tomatoes you couldn't bottle or apples you, couldn't have, you didn't have room to store. He looked around the big old apple tree for windfalls. There were some big ones, difficult to manage without a basket, but he stuffed them into a shirt, making sure there weren't any wasps in them first. What else? He saw a line of carrots, his favourite fruit. He was allowed to pull up carrots, they were good for his teeth. So he heaved up a few good sized ones and rubbed the earth off his fingers. Then he had the idea to run, run into the tool shed where he found a ball of garden string. It was alright just to borrow it. Back again he ran, across the garden, over the fence, across the paddock, over to the copse and through the brambles and dead leaves to the edge of the pit. He sat himself comfortably on the trunk of the tree that curved out over the pit like the neck of a camel and carefully looked again at what he could see. There was a broken edge of a cliff where there were trailing creepers. There at the bottom were scattered lumps of chalk that had come down with them. And, and now that he was really looking, he could see a piece of new, new linoleum. 
Well, not exactly new. Nothing in the dump was new. But it looked as if it had been put there not long ago, because it wasn't covered with moths, or things like that had been there for a long time. And he couldn't see. At one side of the pile of branches and things that the stig was leaning to stig's leaning to roof, a faint path in the bottom of the pit that led to the front of the den. He found the end of the ball of string and tied a bunch of carrots to it. Then he began to pay out the string with the carrots dangling to, on the end towards the bottom of the pit. He hoped it was long enough. There always seemed to be miles of string in a ball, but it dwindled and dwindled as he lowered the carrots down until he was afraid that he couldn't reach the bottom. Bother! A cobble, a regular spider's nest of tangled string, appeared, and he began to stop to uncobble it. At last, within a few feet in hand, the carrots were swinging on a level with Stig's front door. Barney's seat was not quite above it, so he had to get the carrots swinging to and fro all the way beneath him. We're back. Barney's seat was not quite above it, so he had to get the carrots swinging to and fro all the way beneath him until they were actually knocking at the door like five pink fingers. Barney was bubbling so much with laughter inside him at the trick he was playing on Stig that he forgot to be dizzy. Stig, he called down to the pit. Morning, Stig. I'm knocking at your door. And suddenly, out from the stack of branches appeared the tussle head of Stig and stayed there wagging to and fro, following the swinging carrots like a cat watching a pendulum. Barney nearly fell off the tree with laughter. Hello, Stig, he called. Good morning, I'm Barney. You remember, how are you? Stig looked up, and for a moment Barney felt quite frightened at the ferocious scowl on his face, and was glad to be high up out of his reach. Should he have played a trick on Stig? Perhaps he didn't have what grown-ups called as a sense of humour. Did Stig's have a sen have sense of humours. But when Stig made out who was sitting above him, his face suddenly changed. His big white teeth showed a broad grin. He waved both his arms over his head, and he jumped about in the bottom of the pit to show how pleased he was. Have a carrot, Stig, called Barney. For you, he said, pointing to Stig. To eat, he added. Good for your teeth, he said, biting, making biting movements. Stig leapt at the carrots as he swung past, caught them, looked at them closely, smelt them, and put one in his mouth, and crunched it. He looked up at Barney, smiling with his mouth full, to show that he'd liked his present. Then he made signs which clearly meant what Barney was to come down. Well, I'm not going to jump this time, said Barney, and the string's too thin to climb down. I'm going to go round, he said, making a circling movement with his arms. He got off his perch, and walked along the long way round the top of the pit, to the shallow end, where he got out the night before. It was more difficult finding his way to Stig's den along the floor of the pit than it had been finding his way out the night before. The dump looked quite different, more cheerful, with the sunlight pouring down through the golden autumn leaves, and the ash and sycamore seeds dwindling down from the trees on top. But the tail of an aeroplane was only part of a farm machine, and the ship's helm was, bro was a broken cartwheel. There was a bicycle too, just a rusty frame with bits of brake hanging onto it. Never mind. He found something much more interesting. He had seen it and spoken to it in broad daylight. A real life Stig. And he was going to visit him. That's if he could find his way among the giant, giant nettles. Suddenly, there was a Stig, coming to meet him straight through the net nettle patch, as if stings, stings meant nothing to him. Barney stopped. What now? Shake hands, rub noses? No, perhaps not. He remembered the apples that he had stowed inside his shirt, took one out and held it towards Stig on the palm of his hand as he was to trying to make friends with a horse. I hope you like carrots, Stig, said Barney. Have an apple. Stig took the apple, quite politely, between the finger and thumb, not between his teeth, as Barney somehow expected him to, and sniffed it. Barney took out another apple for himself and bit into it. Good, he said. Delicious. Stig took a, took a bite. He seemed to like it. He smiled and they both started walking towards the den, munching their apples. Stig just blundered through the nettles as far as Barney could see. They stung him and raised bubs. But they did not they did on other people, but he just didn't care. Barney himself avoided the nettles as much as he could. He got stung once or twice, but decided not to make a fuss about it. Stigs don't mind stings, he thought, so he better not. Stig led the way to the den. 
Barney noticed several dumps of new white chalk near the path and remembered the new tunnelling he had seen yesterday and the baby's bath full of chalk. Been digging, Stig? he asked, pointing to the dumps. Sting, Stig grinned and nodded. It was gloom and overhung at Stig's end of the pit, even on this bright day. And the den itself, now that the hole in the roof was mended, was even darker. The teapot lamp was flickering and throwing a dim light in the den, and the place where Stig had been digging. But it was not very cheerful. Come to think of it, thought Barney, rabbits and things that live in the holes don't have any light at all. Not much fun for them, with no windows. Couldn't you find some windows for Stig? What made it worse was that Stig had started a small fire in the den part. He must have just done it, because Barney had not noticed any smoke when he was sitting on the tree trunk. The smoke was filling up the den, and there was no way out for it except to trickle through the gaps of the roof. It made Barney's eyes water, but he supposed it was one of those things you just had to bark with, like the nettles. All the same, the place could do with a chimney, as well as windows. He began to get used to the darkness, and he could see the tunnel at the back of the cave went further back into the chalk than he had noticed. The digging tools were laying about, the bedstead leg, the broken cast iron shoe scraper, and an iron bar like the one he had seen his father use on the jack to lift up the car. Stig was reaching up to offer Barney another turnip, but Barney didn't feel like the turnip, so soon after breakfast. Can I help you dig, Stig? he asked. I expect you're busy anyhow. He went to the end of the tunnel and picked up a bit of the bedstead and began to attack the wall of chalk. It was, it was not as easy as expected. The chalk inside of the hill was, here was firm, not as crumbly as it was on the outside where the rain had got at it. Barney's ba Barney bashes with the awkward piece of metal only bro broke off smallish chips of chalk and he was soon puffed. Stig, who had been standing watching him, took a digger from his hands and showed him how to dig out a hollow at the bottom of the chalk wall and then knock down large chunks which came away easily because they were not held up underneath. There was soon a pile of loose chalk and Barney picked it up with his hands and put it in a small tin bath. When it was full, about, when it was full, it was about as much as he could drag along the floor of the cave towards the entrance. Stig helped him, and between them they lugged out the load out of the den and dumped it. But Barney noticed that Stig took it, took care to put it away from. Yeah. But Barney noticed that Stig took care to put it some way away from his door. He supposed that piles of new white chalk would let people know that something was going on. Stig let him dig next time, and he soon got the hang of cutting under and letting it tumble down from the top. Now and then they would come to a great flint embedded in the chalk, like a fossil monster with knobs and bulges, and they would have to chip around it, worry it, and loosen it like a tooth until at last came free, usually bringing down a lot of chalk with it. They worked on happily for quite a time, taking it in turns to dig and load, and now and then they would stop for a break and take a drink of water from the tin, or eat a refreshing apple. Barney's jeans were white with chalk dust, and the hair and nails were full of it. He suddenly wondered what his grandmother would say. Then he suddenly wondered what time it was. In spite of the apples, his tummy was telling him that it might be lunchtime. You haven't got a clothes brush, have you, Stig? he asked. Stig looked blank, and Barney decided that he probably hadn't. His eye fell on Stig's water pipe. Somebody had thrown away the vacuum cleaner, so there must be one of those brush things somewhere. Sure enough, he spied one, fixed as a short piece of tea pipe on the end of a long thin pole that was helping to hold the roof up. He thought the roof might hold itself up for a bit while he got the worst of the chalk dust off of the vacuum cleaner end, and it did. Stig was watching with a puzzled look, wondering why Barney should be pulling down part of the roof to brush his clothes with. You're lucky, Stig, said Barney. Nobody asks you how you got in such a mess. I've got to go now. Must be nearly lunchtime. Pity I can't ask you to lunch, but... But really, he thought, nobody else even believes in him yet. I'll be back this afternoon, Barney said from the door. Thanks for letting me help you. Goodbye. Grandmother and Lou were getting late back from the town, so he had time to chalk, get the chalk out of his nails and hair and to look fairly respectable for lunch. They were too they were too full to talk about how they spent their morning to question him about what they had been doing. Over the stewed apples he was able to say quietly, Granny, have you got any things you don't want? 
Things I don't want, dear, Grandmother repeated. What sort of things? Chilblains? Grandchildren? No, Granny, I mean things like windows and chimneys. Grandmother thought that this thought about this for a moment, and then said that she really couldn't think of anything like windows and chimneys, except windows and chimneys, and she thought the house had only just had enough of these to go round. And Lou just laughed and said, Really, Barney? Then Grandmother said that it did remind her that there were some tins and jam jars that she had meant to put out for the dustbin man, and perhaps Bar Barney would, like, would be a deer and carry them to the gate. There were more jam jars than Barney had thought possible, and quite a lot of useful tins, the sort with lids. Barney looked at them. The dustbin man wouldn't say thank you for them, he thought. Why shouldn't Stig have them? He remembered a big wooden box which Grandfather helped him fix wheels onto, so that he and Lou could use it as a cart. He searched round and found it among the firewood. But still with its four wheels or more straight, and a piece of rope on the front to pull it with, he loaded it with jam jars and tins, and found quite a weight when he set off across the paddock with it. He looked at Flash, the pony, and struggled through a clump of long grass, and called it rather crossly, you might come and help pull instead of standing there. But he knew that Flash took a lot of persuading to be caught, to be caught Lou to ride him, let alone for pulling carts. The pony just stood and watched, tossing his head now, and then in the afternoon flies. By the time Barney got his load to the edge of the pit, he was quite tired, but there was still a problem of getting it to the bottom. He sat on the camel's neck tree trunk. The string was still there. It was a thick brown sort, and he thought it would be strong enough for a few jam jars. He called to Stig, and after time Stig came out backwards, like a badger with its bedding, dragging a load of chalk. I've got some things for you, Stig, Barney called, and pulled up the string and took it, and took the end to the pile of jam jars. About eight of them were packed in a cardboard box. It would take too long to pass them down one by one, so he tied the string around the box, took it carefully along the tree trunk, and started to lower it. This wasn't nearly as easy as the carrots. The box swung wildly, the string round it, and it started to slip. The part he was holding tried to run through his fingers and burned his hands. He took a turn around the stump of a branch and let it out and around that, hardly daring to look down and see what was happening. He hoped Stig wouldn't get a jam jar on his head. The box was hanging one by one corner and then it reached the ground, but instead of untying the box, Stig disappeared into his den. Hey Stig, undo it, called Barney. There's still more to come. Stig came out again, holding what was left of a large, broad-rimmed lady's hat straw, lady's straw hat, with ribbons to tie under the chin. He untied the string from the box and tied it to the ribbons. He made it made quite a useful looking cargo sling. Jolly good idea, Stig, Barney shouted. Stig's got brains, he thought. After that, it was quite easy. He hauled up the hat, filled it with jam jars, lowered it down with a string, running around the stump of the branch, waited for Stig to unload, hauled it up again, and so on. When he had finished the jam jars, he started on the tins. They were much lighter. And when he had lowered all the tins, he looked at the truck. How strong is this string, he wondered. Could he send the truck down the same way? If he didn't, he wouldn't have to trundle it all the way down the pit to the top and along the bottom of the pit. He wound the string a few times around the branch stump, leaving enough loose to reach the truck on the cliff top, trunk on the cliff top, humping himself along the tree trunk. Tied the string to the wheel of the truck, moved back along the trunk, and pulled the trunk towards him by the string. The truck lurched over the edge of the cliff, swung wildly outwards on the string, which ran out so fast that he couldn't stop it, until a tangle in the string made it stop with a jerk. The string broke, and the truck was falling through the air. Barney held on for dear life to the tree, with his face against the mossy bark, and shut his eyes. He felt weak and dizzy. At last he allowed himself to look down. He couldn't see the truck at first. Then he saw it and swung out to land in the branches of an elder tree, and was hanging there quite happily. I've sent the truck down, he called to Stig. It may come in useful. He was still feeling what his grandmother used to call hot and cold all over, but he carefully inched himself off the tree and on to firm ground, and set off round and round, and down towards the pit. A pity he couldn't let himself down on the rope, but no, he thought, he wouldn't just try that yet.
His idea of sending things down on the string had been a good one, though. He thought to himself as he walked through the copse. Another day, he'd have to find some more tins and jam jars to send down. He hoped Stig liked them. They would come in useful for, well, for, well, things that may come in useful, if you kept them long enough. By the time he got to the den, Stig had untangled the trunk, truck from the tree that was squatting and looking at it, and the tins and the jam jars, and then Barney wondered where they were, what they were going to do with them. These are jam jars, Stig, he explained. Jam and marmalade come in them, and you can use them for keeping stuff in, rice and coffee and things like that. But did Stig want to keep rice and coffee in his den? And these are tins. They're empty, of course, but you get all sorts of things in tins. Peaches and baked beans. You have to open them with an opener like this. He took out a pocket. He took out of his pocket a tin opener, which he usually carried about with him. It was a sort of a butterfly handle which you had to turn. Just to show, he fitted it onto the bottom of the empty tins and twisted the handle. The opener crept around the edge of the tin and the blade ploughed through the metal at the bottom. And soon the shiny round disc of metal came loose. Stick was fascinated. He looked at the flat round piece of tin which had been at the bottom. He looked at the empty tube which was all that was left of the rest of it. And he took the tin opener from Barney and turned the handle. But he couldn't quite make it out. It's quite easy, Stig, look. And Barney took another tin, fitted the opener on the bottom and showed him how to work it. And there was another round plate and another tin tube. Then Stig had to have a go. And they, then they started on the third. One of the tins had been rather flattened, but it gave Barney an idea of how it might be used. He took it left Stig with the others and towed the truck into the den and along the place where Stig had been digging at the chalk. There was quite a lot of loose rubble lying around there and Barney set to work to shovel it into the truck with a flattened tin. It was certainly better than using his hands, though it wasn't quite the right, this wasn't quite the right sort of shovel shape yet. He hammered at it with an unbroken flintstone and made it into quite a handy scoop, like the sort of village grocer used for shoveling sugar into little paper bags. He toiled away at the truck. He toiled away until the truck was heaped full. He he it held much more chalk than a tin bath, and because of its wheels, he could pull it away quite easily. Look, Stig, he said as he went past this, as he went past where Stig was sitting. Look at all the chalk I've loaded. But Stig seemed too busy to notice. Barney wheeled the truck along to the place where they were now dumping the chalk, and tipped out his load, then ran back to the den with the truck bouncing empty along behind him. When they got back, Stig was sitting there, surrounded by plates of tin and empty tubes, and just in the act of taking the bottom out of the last tin. Stig, what are you doing? exclaimed Barney. You've spoiled all the tins now. You can't keep things in tins with no bottoms. He was really quite annoyed. What was the use of a lot of tin tubes with no ends? Stig sat there playing with them. He seemed to have an idea of fitting one inside the other but it wouldn't work because they were all the exact same size. However, one of them, he had, got pinched and did fit into another, which seemed to please him a lot. Barney thought it was a bit childish of Stig to sit there playing, like a baby with plastic bricks, when there was all that work to be done. But Stig went on, seriously worrying over the problem of fitting them together. He found that by pinching them together, pinching together the end of the tin, he could make them fit into the next one and soon he had four or five fitted together like the length of a stovepipe. Stovepipe? Barney knew there was something Stig needed badly. You are a clever Stig, he said. You've made a chimney. Stig looked blank. He didn't know that he needed a chimney. He didn't know what a chimney was. Certainly he had made one, but if it hadn't been for Barney, he wouldn't have known. Working together, they fitted all the tins one into the other until they had a pipe that was taller than either of them. With Barney directing, they carried it into the smoky den, where it was too long to stand upright. Now all we've got to do is poke through the roof, said Barney. Stig looked doubtfully at him, but together they managed quite easily to push it through the crack between the piece of, piece of linoleum and a sheet of corrugated iron. But now what? They couldn't just leave it hanging above the fire. I know, exclaimed Barney, the bath. He left Stig patiently holding the chimney and went and fetched a tin bath. What luck, 
it had a rusty hole in the bottom, which only needed a little work with a boot scraper to make it big enough for the chimney to fit through. Stig was, Stig was dimly beginning to see what Barney was trying to do. Together they built up the fireplace of chalk blocks and big flints, rested the bath upside down on top, and there was a mantelpiece and a chimney. And with the flue leading from the hole in, in the upturned bath, through the roof and into the open air. Barney lit the fire, which Stig had laid as they built the fireplace, and threw some additional scraps of paper and twigs onto it. Once the smoke had learned its way up the roaring pipe, they pushed outside, and they was coming they rushed outside, and there coming out was of what looked like a proper chimney pot sticking through the roof. Stig just watched, fascinated. There you are, Stig, said Barney. Now you've got a proper fireplace. People can come and visit you without getting their eyes full of smoke. Actually, Stig didn't really seem to care about having the place full of smoke, but he was pleased with his fireplace, as if it had been a new toy, and kept on putting twigs and leaves on the fire so he could go out and see the smoke coming out the other end. And Barney was so proud of his invention that he looked around for something else to invent. He saw the stack of jam jars, what he had brought those for. It would be too dull just to use them to keep food in. Stig's den wasn't exactly that sort of place. He had to think of a new way of using the jam jars. What he had thought Stig's house needed the most. A chimney, well he had got that now. A chimney and, well yes, a window. Well, windows were made of glass and so were jam jars. Yes, but the shape. Doors were being made of wood and so were clothes bags. Ships were made of steel and so were tin openers. But you can't make a ship out of tin openers, or a door out of clothes pegs. The shape's all wrong. You couldn't hammer glass flat, could you? He picked up the boot scraper. No, of course not. Stig had stacked the jars on top of each other, lying on their sides. They made a, they made a sort of wall of glass like that, but they rolled about, and of course there were gaps between the jars. Barney looked at one side of the den, the darkest side, which really needed windows. It was built of broken boxes from the dump outwards, and open, open tops inwards. He took the digging tool and knocked the bottom out of one. There was now an open square where the daylight came in. But so did the wind, and Stig didn't seem at all pleased at sitting in a draught. Stig's like to be snug, thought Barney. He carried the jars in and stacked them in the frame of the box. They fitted quite well. The light came in, but the draught came in too. Stig got up and looked at the gaps between the jars, grunted, and then went out of the den. Barney followed him, wondering. Stig led the way along the bottom of the cliff to where they had been lately. They had, been a late, they had lately been a landslide, and quite a large chunk of the cliff top had come down in one piece. Between the topsoil and the chalk, there was a layer of red clay, good, damp, squidgy stuff you could make model animals with. Stig began to dig out through the dumps of clay with his fingers, and Barney found another way, good, Barney found another good clay mine and did the same. They got as much as they could carry and took it back to the den. And from the outside, Stig set to work to fill the gaps in between the jam jars. They had to make two more journeys before all the jam jars were firmly bedded in clay. And then Bar Barney carefully wiped the smears of the bottoms of the jars with a rag. Then they stood and admired their window. They even made faces at each other, one standing inside and one standing outside because you could almost see through it. It certainly let light in, even though it was late in the afternoon and there was not much light to be let in. Well, well, said Barney, that's that. It was the thing he had often heard his grandfather say when he'd finished a job. He was tired after all the inventing that he had done. He went to sit down and he saw all the round plates of tin that Stig had cut out laying on the floor. He gathered them up. They must be a use for these too. He went back to the window and found the discs fitted exactly over the ends of the jars if he pressed them into the soft clay. They were just enough to go round. There you are, Stig, like on a ship, to shut the portholes. If you don't want people to look in, or the dark, or shut the dark out. There was a feeling in the air that darkness was coming, and that it would be snug to sit by the new fireplace and watch the fire going up the chimney. But Barney suddenly remembered something and stood up with his mouth open. Stig he said. I've got to go home. All the way home, I mean. I probably won't be staying with Granny until Christmas. Stig looked at him. Stig, said Barney, when I come back again, you, 
You'll still be here, won't you? Stig didn't answer, but he went to a little niche in the chalkboard, poked about some things there and brought something back, which he gave to Barney. He looked at it. It was a little chipped flint, perfectly shaped like a flat Christmas tree and very sharp. An arrowhead, Barney gasped. For me? Oh, thank you, Stig. I really must go now, though. See you at Christmas. You will be here at Christmas, won't you, Stig? Goodbye. And he ran off. As he made his way along the bottom of the pit, he felt he knew that there was a better he felt he knew the way there better than anywhere else in the world. And he felt that Stig's house was much more his home than anywhere else after all. It was like drawing pictures. Once you've put up a chimney and a window on a house, you've really made a house.